Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Muddy Outdoors, Hoyt Archery, Fuse Accessories, Frigid Forage, Scott Archery, Cabela's, Trophy Rock, Night and Hail Game Calls, TrailCamPro.com, Blood Sport Arrows, Rocket Broadheads, and Nikon. This is the double G4 buck. And he's got a double set of G4s. Both beams had two G4s, which is pretty cool. And he's a young deer. We filmed him last year in the end of October, just a little ways down on the edge of this food plot. And I passed him up at that time. And he's got almost no mass, but good time length. So he, if he's gonna be a four-year-old this year, they usually make a big jump from three to four. He could just be a whopper. We're gonna be looking for him down in this small food plot. If I'd only known then what I was getting myself into, Back in 2009, the double G4 buck was just one of 16 bucks on my hit list. 16 bucks, and he wasn't even at the top of the list. It's amazing how much bigger a part of my plans that buck became over the next four seasons. During the 2009 season, the double G4 buck really blew up from what was a nice, you know, long time, uh, spindly three and a half year old buck in 2008 he blew up into a big mainframe tin. And as soon as I saw him on the 5th of November, I knew he was the buck I wanted to spend the rest of the season hunting. Oop, there's a big one right there. Serious. That morning I almost killed the buck, and looking back on it, I'm sure I'm glad now that he got away. He was up on a ridge. It was actually the same ridge, believe it or not, where I ended up shooting him on November 3rd this year. Tried to call to him, he wouldn't come in. Finally, after three or four loud grunts, he started walking right straight for the tree. And I don't know whatever happened to him. We never saw him disappear. We didn't. We don't know which direction he went. But in the meantime, another buck came in that that uh, ended up shooting, and it was a buck that we nicknamed Survivor. Another one of the bucks on my 2009 hit list. So we were hoping that still this buck would show back up through the rest of the season. And now we set ourselves to hunting him every single day. And there was no specific strategy for the double G4 buck. So we spent a lot of time in that same stand where I'd killed Survivor, and then. We saw him again in early December in a different spot, about a half a mile away. So we set to hunting him there uh, until the shotgun season came in. As soon as the shotgun season was over, then we hunted him any place we could find food in that general area. And I can remember some really brutal hunts that we had for that buck. So that's kind of the way the season went in 2009. You know, we stayed on the buck, uh, got a few trail camera pictures of him toward the very end. We didn't have a real good feel for where this deer lived. We knew we were kind of in the game, but we didn't have him pinned down very well. His range was fairly large uh, during 2009, and we were just kind of pecking around the edges. Uh, so going into 2010, of course, that was then the number one buck on the hit list. And especially after we started getting some trail camera pictures of him in 2010 on that same ridge again. So now we're starting to, if you, if you follow along, we're connecting a lot of dots here. We keep ending up with that same local area, the same small spot where this buck seems to be spending the most of his time. We didn't get any summertime uh, video footage of him. We didn't get hardly any trail camera pictures of him, except a few in October, but we hunted him for the whole season. And it was just day after day after day grind, you know, hunting that buck's, you know, whatever we thought was his range. He would have been a five-year-old buck that year. And I'm starting to come up with the theory that these five-year-old bucks are the, that's when they're the hardest to find. That's, I've heard people call it the ghost year. I, I certainly would agree with that. You know, especially when it came to the double G4 buck, because we hunted all around that area. We hunted hard. We tried to hunt smart the whole time. Never saw him. Never got one glimpse of him. Didn't get any daylight photos of him during 2010. So, Going into the 2011 season, I wasn't super excited about the prospects of hunting him again, just because of what I'd been through the year before. So uh, anyway, going into the 2011 season, Greg was filming uh, a soybean field, and the double G4 buck popped out on there, and he just had blown up again. You know, now he'd gone from being, let's, let's track him through, in 2008 he was probably in the low 140s, uh, 2009 he was probably gross in the 160s somewhere. Uh, 2010, he was probably high 170s, and uh, 2011, he jumped way up. 
now we're looking at a buck that's going to gross. Um, you know, I'd, well, I know what he grossed because we've got the sheds. I mean, he was over 200 inches. So he made a big jump from five to six. As exciting as it was to have a buck that size on the farm, there was a part of me that wasn't looking forward to hunting him again. Just because of the history I had with this deer, I just thought that I was going to spend a whole another year hunting a ghost. So I knew that something had to change in 2011. I wasn't going to hunt this buck again day after day after day if he wasn't showing up during daylight. So the big change I made in my strategy for 2011 was just saturating that area with trail cameras. I started putting cameras in locations that I hadn't put them in the past. And the whole idea was to learn as much as I could about this deer as early as I could. I put the cameras out a lot earlier in 2011 than I had in the past and got some daylight pictures of him in, I believe it was in mid-September. He had just shed his velvet, just a giant frame. So you're thinking, well, maybe something's changed. You know, we've, we've got him right back in the same area again. Now we've got two locations where this buck seems to be spending most of his time, down in a little valley and up on the ridge right next to it. So we saturated those areas with cameras and got a really good profile of what this buck was doing. So really what I was focused on for the 2011 season was one particular stand that we had nicknamed Death Ridge, and it's adjacent to that ridge where he was spending all of his time. And I didn't really want to hunt on the ridge itself because it seemed too risky to go into a feeding area and put a stand right up on the edge uh, with all the does that come out and the, the prospect of, of uh, spooking a couple of deer, bumping deer, not only when you're on the stand but when you go to leave the stand in the evenings. I had to back off just a little bit. And I came down this secondary ridge, and that was, again, the Death Ridge stand. It's about 150 yards uh, from the ridge top where the double G4 buck was showing up most often. So we put a bunch of time in there. We just hunted the spot day after day, and uh, the double G4 buck just didn't show up. And again, you know, I feel like I'm hunting that ghost again, although I did have those daylight pictures. You know, so there is that glimmer of hope now that this buck you know, does have some type of a daylight movement pattern. Finally, uh, the well-documented hunt of November 9th, 2011, when uh, I really could have had him that day. You know, and in hindsight, um, you know, who knows? It would have been fun to have shot him that day and, and seen the, the G5 buck get away and hunt him a year later. But uh, either way you look at it, uh, it was another encounter with the double G4 buck right in that same core area where we were used to seeing him. He had a doe, the doe was coming to us, he was following the doe, the G5 buck, a big horse, a brute of a buck came in and fought him for a short while and ran him off. Then the G5 buck came back in to claim the doe and I shot him instead. So we're really starting to stack up uh, this information. And I guess that's the one thing that's so fun about hunting bucks over a number of years. You really start to learn their personalities, you start to stack up a lot of encounters and a lot of information and you really start learning um, how this deer acts, where he lives, what maybe some of his weaknesses might be. Um, every one of these bucks is different when they reach maturity. And you can't hunt them, you know, with just sort of like a stereotypical method. They're not all the same. So you've got to hunt them as individuals, so that means you've got to learn their individual traits. So that was the first step, and it took a few seasons, really, to start putting that all together. And around the 20th or so of November, I started putting cameras back out again on that ridge. And as soon as I pulled those cards, uh, he was all over the place. And I think, I think it's because the G5 buck was dead. I think that the G4 buck, his dominance was a little bit suppressed, and maybe he was being a little bit more careful in when he moved and where he moved, because he didn't seem like he was a real aggressive deer. So now finally this buck is consistently moving during daylight. This is a buck that I really should be able to kill. If I, if I don't get this deer, I'm going to be forever thinking that I screwed it up. So going into the late season, I knew I had to be a little bit creative because the way this buck was coming out on that feeding area, you know, I couldn't count on him always coming from the same direction. And even if I could, you still have all those risks associated with hunting a feeding area. So I figured I had to have some kind of a blind in there if I wanted to kill him with my bow. So my friend Jason Vickerman and I set out to build a specialized ground blind. Well, it was a double-decker blind, and I'm sure you've seen it. It became infamous on the Midwest Whitetail shows. But the double G4 buck was never that accommodating. We've been through a lot of that already with last season's shows, but just in summary, uh, he, he would come out early, he would feed at a distance for a very long time, and then right at the last second he'd pick his head up and start to go around the blind. And he'd move fairly fast and fairly unpredictably, and that would sort of throw us into a chaos inside the blind. I had a chance at him on January 2nd. It was a fairly close range shot, 30 yards or so. I hit him way up high in the hump. So, deer gets away, um, he shows back up again right after the season's over with, right back on the cameras again on that field. 
So rather than getting into all those events, let me just touch on the strategy. The strategy worked um, in this case. The idea was to use the blind to be able to hunt the speeding area with a bow without alerting a whole bunch of deer and to use the Bushnell trail cameras in field scan mode to tell me when the buck had finally accepted the blind. Interestingly, it took 10 days. So now let's move forward. Uh, found the sheds off this buck at the very end of January. Uh, that was kind of fun too because I ran the camera right there on a pile of corn, right back on that ridge, until we got pictures of the buck without uh, the antlers. So we went in there the very next day after I got those pictures of the buck without antlers and we found both sides. One was on the ridge, not 40 yards from where the blind had been, and the other one was on Death Ridge, not 40 yards from where that tree stand was on that, on that little secondary ridge. So again, all the, the dots are clumping up in one spot, which if you talk to people who have had a chance or a privilege like I have now of hunting some of these older deer, it does seem like their ranges continue to shrink down as they get older. So now we're going to fast forward to the 2012 season. Let's start with the summer 2012. We spent a lot of time filming on that ridge. It was beans uh, this past season. In the area where we'd filmed him during the summer of 2011, uh, we filmed in that area and again he didn't show up there. I think his range had gotten even smaller yet. I think what he was doing was he was spending the whole summer feeding in one little small, one acre, lush, uh, frigid forage. Uh, it was a pure trophy blend clover patch down in this bottom. And I think he, he spent the whole summer feeding in that one little spot. Uh, but I did start running cameras over the trophy rocks in a couple spots nearby. So we did get a fair number of photos of him on the trophy rock uh, in, I guess it'd be July and August. So the whole trick was uh, coming up with a pattern, uh, figuring out where he was vulnerable and when he was moving during the day. It was the end of September when I first started getting a lot of daylight pictures of him again. And he was coming out uh, on that ridge top and he was in, his, in a big and beastie food plot. And there was a bunch of does up there too. So he wasn't the only deer feeding there. So of course, that meant I had to bring my blind back out again. You know, I had this whole, the whole thing of not wanting to educate these other deer. So the first time I went in there this past season to hunt him was the 5th of October. And I almost got him that night. It was a close call. It wouldn't have been for a doe that busted me opening one of the windows on the blind. I really feel like I could have gotten him that evening. So now the plan stayed the same. Just keep monitoring those cameras, figure out where he's at and when, uh, figure out when he's vulnerable in certain areas, you know, what winds can we hunt him on. And I think what would surprise people was how conservative that I really was with this buck. Never made any sense to be aggressive with this deer toward the end here because he wasn't going anywhere. I mean, he was living in 30 acres. You know, why did I want to take risks in diving in there and hunting a spot where the wind might be swirling or maybe on a slightly marginal wind, I just wouldn't hunt. I would just wait, 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 wait. As soon as the conditions were right, I'd move in. And it was really working out good. I mean, I was getting all kinds of encounters with this buck. I mean, it seemed like every time we went in to hunt him, we were filming him or seeing him, either in the bottom or up on that ridge, and most often up on the ridge. I made it all the way through the month of October like that. I had another shot at him on the 30th of October, and it was real similar to what happened to me during 2011. He was walking by at last light, didn't have the right windows open. By the time I got situated in the blind, I'd kind of lost track of how far away he was. I grunted to stop him. Um, it was probably an ill-advised shot, to be honest with you, because I couldn't see my pins real well. But it also made me really disgusted with the blind itself. Uh, I wasn't enjoying myself in there. I was too boxed in. You know, I didn't like viewing my world through a little five-inch wide window. So I abandoned the blind, and I thought, you know, for better or for worse, we know enough about this buck now that we're gonna take our chances out of tree stands up on this ridge or down in the bottom. So I guess we're talking about managing risk still. And now I had to figure out how am I gonna hunt this ridge from a tree stand. There wasn't really a, a smart play there, but from watching him out of that blind so much, more than half of the time when he came into that ridge, he came in from the left-hand side as you're looking out of the blind. And there was a point of trees there and one of the trees at the end of the point was a big cottonwood. And it appeared from the footage that we had of him from the blind that he was coming within about 15, anywhere from 15 to 20 to 30 yards from that big cottonwood. And it required a perfect wind because if it fluctuated at all or swirled at all, the deer that were out on the ridge already, assuming he wasn't the first one out, were gonna pick us off and smell us and, and 
you know, blow off the field. And that presumably would be the end of the action for that evening. So there was some stuff working against us. The first time we went in there was the 1st of November. We did have a little swirling that day on a northwest wind. One doe did pick us off. So we we're a little bit leery of the spot. I'd almost written it off. In fact, I think I did write it off. But just two days later, we had a northeast wind. And I thought, okay, just that little 90 degree change in wind direction should be enough to eliminate that swirl and take our scent down uh, over a valley and, and away from the direction that we think the G4 buck is coming up on. We'd never seen him come from that direction. I mean, we had so many data points now that we could start to, you know, sort of exclude areas. And it's really, really, really rare. I don't know how, how, you know, how to impress that upon you other than say really a whole bunch of times. Uh, it's really rare that you can have a deer that is this visible and this narrowly patterned. I mean, he's a very, very unusual deer. I mean, he's, not only was he big, but he was visible and he did the same thing, you know, quite often. So anyway, we felt like we knew him well enough now that we could just sort of throw caution to the wind, so to speak, and let our scent blow uh, down through some timber on the same side of the ridge that he came out on, but far enough down that we just figured he never would come up that way. Uh, and we were right about that. It turned out that, that it did work out. Uh, the wind laid down that night, November 3rd, and it really came into a, a more of a thermal uh, situation. And the thermals were washing down the valley and going down behind us and down below in more or less the direction that he came from, but not exactly where he came from. And uh, just, you know, I guess when you start looking at this whole thing, this whole hunt for this buck, um, you know, we can go back and we can talk about the events of the hunt and all that, but more extraordinary, I think, is the personality of this deer and how that took shape over the four years that I hunted him. You know, how, how his personality changed and became more ingrained and how we learned uh, what that personality was. And it, it became, uh, you know, an, an individual pursuit. And I think that's what makes it tough when it's all over with and the deer's gone is because he had so much fun hunting him. It's a situation where every time I went out, I felt like I could get into this buck. You know, with high probability, I'm gonna have an encounter with this deer because we'd learned him so well and he was so unique in, in his visible nature. Uh, made a great deer to tell a story about, you know, for the video blogs and the, and the episodes on the show, because he went right along with the script. Whenever we needed him to pop out to keep the viewership on the edge of their seat, there he was. So, I mean, it was, it was really neat from that standpoint. Put a lot of pressure on me because so many people were watching over my shoulder telling me all the stuff I was doing wrong and everything like that. But the bottom line was I stuck to my guns on it and I knew that we couldn't be more aggressive on this deer. You know, we, we, were, we were cautiously aggressive toward the end, but we were very conservative most of the time hunting this deer. We didn't see any reason to be aggressive because he wasn't going anywhere. There was no ticking clock. The only ticking clock was the end of the season. All right, so now I'm gonna close the book on this buck. You know, we've had it chapter by chapter over the four years of hunting him, it's time to close the book. And the there's always an epilogue at the end uh, that sort of summarizes everything. And like I said, this deer was so unique uh, and such a privilege to hunt him. I mean, the adventures, you know, of four years of, of a buck that was, you know, became so visible and was so big. I mean, there was, I mean, he was 205 gross typical inches in 2011. And uh, if he'd have gotten just a little bit bigger, from 2011 to 2012 and didn't trash up. I mean, he was pushing world record size. He was a giant, a uh, huge mainframe six by five. So anyway, again, wrapping my arms around it. Uh, I don't expect to ever hunt another deer like this in my life. Uh, I wish everybody would have the chance to, on some level, uh, find a buck like this that they could pattern and follow through so many years and sort of create this personal quest uh, for a deer like this. And no matter the size of the deer, I'd really encourage you you know, if you have bucks on your property that you really want to hunt, get those cameras out there and learn as much as you can about the deer because it's so much fun. Even if you never kill them, you, know, you feel like every time you go out, you've learned something new. Now you're, you know, you're, you're sort of writing a, another page in the chapter every day when you go out to hunt. And uh, that's a lot of fun. It, it really changes uh, the whole sense of satisfaction that comes from bow hunting. So maybe that's what I took away from it the most is that from now on, uh, I'm not gonna be able to just go deer hunting anymore. It's going to be really tough. I'm going to have to find bucks to hunt because it just, it just changes the way that you interact uh, not only with the deer themselves but with the strategies that you put in place and so forth. 
So a lot of fun. Hopefully you've enjoyed the journey just as much as I have. That's the end of our episode today. I'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.